All right, Punarvasu Nakshatra, part two. In this one, I'm going to be focusing on the deity that rules Punarvasu, the goddess Aditi. And remember, the, the deity is the main thing to be focusing on with these nakshatras. One of the main mistakes that most teachers or most sources of nakshatras make, like when I'm reading books about nakshatras or the courses I've taken, or if you read about on Wikipedia or whatever, in just general um, mainstream sources, you're going to see that they're going to talk all about the planetary lord, like Punarvasu's planetary lord is Jupiter. And there's, sure, there's ways you can connect that because it's about expansion, and Jupiter is a planet of expansion. And then they'll also focus a lot on the Yoni, and then they'll also focus a lot on the planets that rule the Padas, and how the nakshatra, what signs it falls in. But when we realize that, okay, wow, the nakshatras are literally behind the Rashis and are not related to the Rashis and on different yugas and different ages, the nakshatras can fall in different Rashis. We realize that, oh, wow, we have to kind of throw out a lot of that research. You know what I mean? It's not really that relevant. So, yeah, you see so much endless talk about Pada 3, Pada 4, Pada this, Pada that, and um, the planetary lord and the yoni and all these things just are not the most important aspect of the symbolism. And again, the yoni factor was really only used for compatibility for setting up arranged marriages. So if you're not about doing feudal medieval arranged marriages, if you're not that type of person and you're not living in like a classical Indian traditional civilization society, then that's not going to be that relevant to you. Um, the yoni still deals with like our primal instinctive nature and it does kind of have to do with like totem animals and that sort of quality, but still it's way overemphasized because again, like I've talked about, um, people will think of horses and they'll think of Shatabishak when they're not thinking of Ashwini, the horse star, or they'll think of lions and think of Danishta and not think of Leo, you know, the sign of the lion. Um, so just remember to keep that in mind, but that's the tricky thing with nakshatras. There's just so much symbolism of nakshatras. You can kind of fit a lot of the qualities of the Rashis into like one or two tables, but it would take, it takes numerous tables to factor in all the qualities of the nakshatras. So we have to be more specific and it's also very confusing because a lot of these factors seem contradictory. Um, so the first place to start is to narrow down like some of the most important of the qualities. And the most important again, as you've already noticed, noticed if you're taking this course, is the deity, the the nature of it, like moving and unsteady, or light and swift, or fixed and firm, and then the Datu Mula Jiva quality of it, or the Datu Rajas Karma Brahma, or the Mula Boga Vishnu Thomas side, or the uh, Jiva Sattva Nasha Shiva aspect. Nakshatras can only fall in one of those three. And that's really important to focus on, at least in the sense of like, like clinical practice with clients and stuff, you could say. So anyway, sorry for that little discourse. But okay, so now back to Aditi. Um, Punarvasu, it's ruled by goddess Aditi. Now, what's really unique is that there's more than one nakshatra that's ruled by a goddess. And, you know, Vedic culture was really very good about uh, honoring the divine feminine, we must say. Um, and this is unique because Aditi is actually the mother of the Adityas, which means coming from Aditi, the children of Aditi. So the 12 Adityas are the 12 different, these 12 different sun gods or aspects of the sun. So in in, uh, in this system, it's considered that one of the Adityas gets to take over and rule one month out of the year. And it rules all the planets and all the stars for that month out of the year. And so there's 12 Adityas for the 12 months. And these are very important gods. And, you know, we're like we're going to come across a lot of them as we come across these Nakshatras because they rule the Nakshatras. Like Varuna is one of them, you know, who rules Shatabishak. Um, you know, Aryaman is one of them. Uh, there's a lot of them, you know, Twashtri, the architect of the gods. So this is a very important nakshatra because this nakshatra is ruled by the mother 
of all these other gods who rule all these other nakshatras. So this is like the prime mother, you know? And that's one way you can think of Aditi, is she is like this cosmic matriarch. She could almost be thought of as like a, like a parallel to Brahma, but in the feminine form. So, Aditi is a very, very, very important goddess because she rules, she's literally the mother of like, all the other all these other important gods and aditi means like well the uh sound when we put that in front of a word it means not right so uh means not and then ditti is the word which means bound or tied so aditi means unbound untied infinite boundless unbroken entire whole, complete, unimpaired, happy, free. It also even refers to like inexhaustible abundance, perfection, creative power, and Shakti, because that's what the goddess is. And this is the prime goddess star, not the only one, but this is one of the prime ones. This is perhaps the most goddessy star. Yeah, because it actually falls in cancer, the sign of the goddess in this yuga. But again, that would change based on various ages. But in this age, it's especially going to be so. Now, um, as a goddess, she is a vast mothering archetype that personifies the expanding nature of the universe. And it's really quite cool because, you know, science tells us that the universe is infinitely expanding and Vedic philosophy tells us that as well. They, they already felt this way 5,000 years ago, you know? Um, and the other cool thing is that the self is always expanding. And in Vedic philosophy, the universe is thought to just be the external manifestation of the self. And the universe and the self are just intertwined, like Brahma, the creator, and the creation. You know, they're the same thing. Can you really separate uh, liquidity from liquid? You know? Can you really separate, like, luminosity from fire? Can you really separate, like, firmness from the earth? In the same way, you can't really separate creativity from the creator himself. You see? So the creator is Brahma, creativity is Aditi, or is the goddess, or Saraswati, if you want to think of it that way, because that later on came up, or that's also, like, basically another name for the same thing. So it's, it is kind of confusing, but <clears throat> Aditi is kind of a goddess that is so vast she's not able to be nailed down to one thing. So you could say that she works through all the other goddesses, but she's also kind of her own thing, right? So she could manifest in the, very similarly in the same way as Saraswati. She's related to Saraswati or Vak as she's called because again, that's the construct of Brahma and she's basically the, the Shakti of Brahma that's constantly expanding and creating more and more space and universe and matter and creation. But you can also even relate her to Ushas, this ancient goddess of the dawn. The dawn was very important in ancient Vedic culture. Um, and I want to talk about that more too, but we'll, I would get sidetracked, so I don't want to, we'll go into that later. Um, but yeah, so she just can't be nailed down to one thing, like how, you know, there are goddesses of rivers or wealth or this or that. She's more just across the board, just so you know. And this is the this is the the thing you want to focus on if you're really trying to get deep into this star is to read her myths, her legends, all the stories surrounding her. Um, unfortunately, you know, like some of the books I've read, I'm not going to mention. I'm not trying to like you know badmouth anyone, but uh, yeah, like a lot of the other sources I've learned about from Nakshatras, they focus on the Vasus, and they're like Punar Vasu. Oh, like the eight Vasus are this special class of deities, and they'll kind of just talk about that and that's how it got nothing to do with this nakshatra because the vasus rule their own nakshatra danishta or shravishta so i don't feel that that's correct personally um and you know just because vasu is used in that name doesn't mean that's what we should do um vasu can mean many things like i already de described in the last video but yeah so uh, to know more about aditi we will learn more about this this star and this nakshatra so she is the daughter of Daksha and the wife of Rishi Kashyapa. So 
Doc's just like again, he was that remember the guy who was performing the sacrifice? He's like one of these head cosmic uh patriarchs and creators and um as one of the, uh, I mean, th that's that part's, I guess, not that important for this star, but as one of the most, m like, prime nakshatras ruled by a goddess, she really is, like, the most matriarchal goddess, and the goddess is always related to nature, okay? So, this is a star of nature. This is a huge nakshatra that makes nature lovers, essentially. Nature lovers. Um, really, you'll really see this a lot. And environmentalists, big environmentalist people, because this star is all about renewal, rejuvenation, redoing things. So like recycling, people who are nuts about recycling, you know, and all that, this star is very big for that. And, you know, carrying after the creation, you could say. Um, it's, it's also because it's a moving and unsteady star, it's a great nakshatra for travel as well. Um, and so people with this nakshatra, as well as the other two um, nakshatras that are ruled by Rahu, Shatabishak and Swati, all three of these, wait, this one's not ruled by Rahu, forgive me, I mixed it. But either ways, those two are also um, very good for like being outdoors, walking around, traveling, um, hiking and stuff. So yeah, you'll see that this, because the moving and steady nakshatra, because ruled by the goddess of nature and expansion and creation, this uh, is a great, like when the moon's in this nakshatra, it's just a great day to take a hike, to go out and outdoors, to walk around, to get some new fresh air. Because again, the sutra for this, um, I'll try to pull it up here, but if not, the sutra is basically just that, the restoration of the good and the desirable, the punarvasu for aditi is wind from above, and freshness from below, or moisture, or aliveness. The word ardrum, yeah, I uh, I heard s some people were commenting when I was talking about this, saying that, you know, it's wind from above and the primordial waters from below. That's not accurate. That's not what the sutra is saying at all. That's just a total embellishment, because the word used is ardrum, which does not mean primordial waters. It means moisture, sweat, freshness aliveness like the dew on a fresh new like newly grown leaf or plant is ardra or ardrum and there's plenty of words for primordial waters that could have been used if that's what they wanted but the primordial waters are related to varuna the god of that he's literally the god of the sea and the waters and the sky which again the sky and the is thought of as a cosmic sea another type another form of water so I guess that's where they, this person got that idea, or whoever is teaching that, but that's not accurate. That's not what the sutra says, and we already have Varuna and Shatabishak. And then we also have Uttara Bhadrapada, ruled by Ahir Budnya or Ananta Sesha. Sesha Naga is the lord of the cosmic depths, the lord of the seas, literally the Milky Way, you know. So we've already got that covered really well. And, and what we don't have is the freshness, this new fresh air nakshatra. And so this is the nakshatra of fresh air, freshness, newness, bring out something new. We're gonna see when we get to the examples. When this nakshatra is really good, these people have a fresh take on things. They just bring out a beautiful, fresh take on stuff and they bring fresh air into their field or their subject or their whatever the rest of the chart's speaking to. And when this next chapter is afflicted, you see the opposite. You see they try to renew something and it gets worse. Or they try to redo something or repeat a pattern and it gets worse and worse. So it's very fascinating how that plays out. Okay, so yeah. So that's the thing is that um, you there's no... Uh, if you've noticed when it comes to astrology, like credibility is not a thing anymore online on the internet. Pretty much, especially since the pandemic, pretty much like... Uh, we, we saw like a 50% increase in the amount of people claiming to be astrologers who started doing astrology within a few years and they don't really know what they're talking about. And even before that, it was so easy to find, to not really know what you're talking about and be credible. So if you're, you know, want to know more about the nakshatras, it's a really good idea to learn more about yogic culture and learn Sanskrit maybe even. So I have been learning Sanskrit since 2016. So that's kind of why I get to be a little bit of a stickler about the translation of things because I can actually read the grammar and I've trained myself to do that. It's very, uh, you know, tedious, but really anyone can do it. And there's a lot of, uh, you know, there's a lot of like, uh, 
hesitancy around Sanskrit. It seems really intimidating, but honestly, from what I've been told, uh, it's barely more difficult than the, than learning Russian grammar. And you know, uh, there's a lot of people that speak Russian on the planet, so you can learn Sanskrit too. And if you're looking for sources to learn that, feel free to reach out to me, and I can send you to sources. But according to the Sanskrit English Dictionary, yeah, um, uh, this star, it's. It deals with ardrum, which is about renewal and rejuvenation and freshness um, and bringing life back into things. So uh, along with like this idea of like it's a great star for travel, for seeing new places, for, you know, bringing in like a fresh experience, a fresh new environment. It's also because, you know, it's ruled by Ditti, the mother of the gods. It's got a really strong mothering and nourishing nature to it. OK, and this is especially true because it falls in cancer in this age or in this yuga but that would depend on other times but specifically in this yuga this is a major star of really strong like just good mothering energy and um motherhood this is a nakshatra of motherhood aditi is like a queen or a matriarch you know and cancer is the sign of the queen so both of these falling in the same part of the sky if you have a planet there especially the moon um, you're going to have more of a queen-like nature to you, you know, or be more, have, have more emphasis on those, on those things, we could say. Um, the other parts of the Cancer Rashi hold Ardra and Pushya, which carry a different Sanskaric quality that's much more masculine. Um, and so that's why this particular, you know, section of the sky within cancer is really the most feminine goddessy part of the entire 360 degree circle at least for this age so that's a very important thing to take away from this is Punarvas punarvasu is the most mothering nakshatra the most feminine nakshatra um other nakshatras like i said they are ruled by goddesses but they don't fall like they they fall in signs that are not that are more masculine than cancer is if that makes any sense you know um so this is the only one that really falls in a sign that's both feminine goddessy and it's a goddessy nakshatra so it really doubles down on that see that's and you know that's also an important um thing to know about astrology just in general is that cancer is ruled by the moon and the moon is the most 100 percent feminine planet because it only rules a feminine sign so all the other planets rule a male and a female sign except sun and moon sun only rules a masculine male sign moon only rules a feminine female sign and that's why these are so different the sun is 100 percent extroverted and masculine and positive and outgoing and this moon is 100 percent introverted and feminine and negative and you know internal focused and again even astronomically the sun is what shites, shines out all the light in our world the moon reflects the light it doesn't create any light of its own it reflects the light and it takes the light nourishes it and cools it down and then shines it back and makes it into a more uh, beautiful form. You can't even look at the sunlight, you know what I mean, without going blind. That's the masculine aspect of God. We can't even perceive it. It's so hard and so abstract, the impersonal, formless aspect of the Brahman. But the moon is the goddess, the feminine aspect. You know, the moon comes out, it's like, oh, wow, you're just beautiful. I adore you. You can look at the moon all night long, you know, and it won't make you go blind. You see? So there's just a totally different relational quality and that is feminine energy and it's also very neat because you know feminine energy is meant to be adored you know you see like you look at the moon it's like wow you're so beautiful and it's meant to be adored the sun is not meant to be adored you know the sun as we will see more and more as we study this masculine energy is like you know it just needs to light up the kingdom and make the world it doesn't need to be mothered and, oh, you're so good, son, for lighting up the world today. Oh, let's, like, like, let's just talk about it and hug you. And so, was, no, it doesn't want any of that. It just wants to, okay, you know, get the badge. Okay, son, son, light up the world today. He gets the badge for that. Or, you know what I mean? Or he gets, good job. You know, that's it. That's enough <laughs> for the son. Anyways, um, it's important to understand feminine and masculine energy. But uh, yeah, that's basically kind of the gist of it with Punarvasu and Aditi is she's a very 
yeah, this is why you'll see such goddess mothering, like nurturing energy with these types of people. Okay, so it's a Datu Rajas Karma Brahma star. If Punarvasu is a Datu star, we'll just call it that for short, then yeah, it's fitting because, you know, um, Brahma is the creator. And like we said, Aditi is kind of like a the goddess parallel of that. She's all about expanding and creating and nourishing, you know, and the, being unbound. And so, yeah, it makes sense for Rajas and Karma and Brahma because it's, it's such a creative nakshatra. And um, it's also, you know, the Datu stars, mineral, it means stone or mineral. When you, when you walk down your path and you try to step on a mineral or stone, it just has to be strong enough to bear that pressure or crumble. And that's what we see with all the Datu stars. They're focused on um, being constructive and structured and well-structured. And that's kind of how, again, creation follows a certain pattern, like the golden ratio or like, the you know, nature follows a structure in how it grows and expands. So it's perfect. It's so cool that, you know, Punarvasu is this Datu star. And all the Datu stars are, you know, like very constructive. This one's focusing on, or, or you could say they're all focused on building, creating karmas. And this one's more about rebuilding or recreating, right? Um, but it's still focused on building or creating either way. And uh, yeah, like like I said, anything that's got that re before it, like recycling, rejuvenating, reincarnating, these are all Punarvasu things. And yeah, like, like I said, all the Datu stars are about, they're very intent on supporting or being supported. And so you know, Datu stars deal with relying on support and being able to bear pressure like a stone, right? Um, just being so well structured that you can handle whatever comes in life. That's how these Datu stars are. And so in this case with Aditi, the mother of the gods, it's just so fitting because she is the support of all these other gods because she's the mother goddess, you know? So she is literally the supporting breast and bosom of, uh, you know, who supported Varuna and Indra and all these other Adityas, you see? So, like, yeah, this is a major star of, of nourishing and mothering and being supportive uh, and bearing, helping others bear the pressure through nourishment and you learning how to bear the pressure through nourishment. Um, yeah, so it's, it's very interesting and it really makes a lot of sense. Um, And that's, you know, even further why this star has such a mothering energy to it, along with the Cancer Rashi overlap factor. And uh, yeah, it's just know that this one's more focused on like restoring, rebuilding, renewing, but it's still building or, you know, doing things either way. And remember the Sutra. The Sutra is about wind and uh, moisture and freshness. And the, you know, again, that's about like uh, supporting creation. You see, so like Aditi's job is to kind of, the reason she's Datu and everything in Brahma is because that's her job is to renew creation, keep it ever new, keep it ever fresh, keep it ever like infinite. That's what's so cool about creation is that everything is so unique. There will never be another core, you know, there will never be another you. Um, you can have, you can never have the planets rearranged in this exact same way again when you're born. Actually, the regular Rashi chart repeats itself every 60 years, which is crazy. That's a whole other topic to talk about. But the Vargas never repeat. And then, of course, remember, if we're using tropical Rashis and sidereal nakshatras, then it could never repeat again, at least, for, yeah, no, it just can't repeat again because... The nakshatras are always shifting, and so different ages, you know, different nakshatras will be in different signs, and so it just allows for a lot more sophistication. So, yeah, I mean, that's Aditi's job is to keep things fresh. Um, and I know, like, one example I can't wait to use for this is Roy Eugene Davis, uh, my Kriya Yoga guru, who learned directly from Paramhansa Yogananda, and he had an exalted Jupiter, you know, in the ninth house in Cancer and Punarvasu. So he had really good karma from past lives to meet a wonderful enlightened guru like Yogananda. And he had a really deep relationship with him. And it's just something about the way that he teaches and his emphasis. 
he always emphasized just the infinite nature of the self and just the in, like when you're around him and he would guide meditations you were just the way he would talk was just it was so obvious that he was experiencing this this unboundedness this omnipresence I'm getting goosebumps thinking about it. Like, honestly, like you can literally feel omnipresence when you were in the room with him meditating and you could feel Yogananda's presence there too. But this is kind of like this, a good aspect of this Punarvasu quality that, uh, you know, I'll give other examples of as well, but that's, that's one of them. Um, yeah, like, uh, so yeah, Jupiter exalted here in Cancer and in Punarvasu is a really, really good placement. It can save so many other difficult blemishes in the chart if you have that one thing going on. Um, but then afflictions to Punarvasu, you can have more difficulties with all the things I just mentioned. All right, that's enough on this for now.